Okay, now continuing with my Understanding Paul series, uh, last time I spoke of the um, Paul's letter to the Philippians, and today I'm going to attempt to uh, dive into Ephesians. Uh, previously, I delved into the difference between um, the terms Jesus Christ and Christ Jesus. And basically the gist of it was... Um, his use of those words is something of an encoded message. It's there for the benefit of those of us who will be living at the end of time, uh, who will come to understand the secret message that was encoded back at the beginning of the Christian age and which was subsequently lost and is to be recovered at the end of the age. And basically, this is how all of the Bible works. It's explained, again, in prospect, revealed in retrospect by those of us at the end of time who receive the knowledge um, that is being delivered to us by them. Um, but that there was an age, uh, the early age, uh, the, the early reign, if you will, and then there's a latter reign, um, there are revelations given to them that are held in store for us and they're conveyed um, via um, symbols and codes and parables um, such that those of the people in the middle who are not supposed to understand these mysteries fully um, will see them on the level of the flesh, will see them on the level um, of just you know, the immediate proximate sense, and, um, you know, um, basically it's something of a red herring, but it's designed to keep us and to preserve us until the end, at which point they speak to us again on another level. And Paul uses basically two different um, terms here. He uses the term Jesus Christ, and he uses the term Christ Jesus. But these are the order in which he speaks those words is important. That they form a kind of syntax. Uh, just as when Jesus asked his disciples, who do men say that I am? And his disciples say, well, some say that you are uh, Elijah or Jeremiah or one of the uh, prophets come back to life. And then Jesus asks uh, Simon Barjona, um, who do you say that I am? And Simon says um, that thou art Christ, the Son of the living God. So, um, given that Jesus was the name given to Jesus upon his birth in the flesh, Jesus is in a sense an earthly name and a name ascribed to him in his fleshly incarnation, his fleshly existence. So when you see the name Jesus, it applies to the fleshly level. Um, you think of Jesus in terms of what he did in the Gospels. He did, in a sense, in the flesh and in the spirit. But there was a corresponding uh, reality, a spiritual reality that corresponded to his fleshly reality. Uh, so everything he did as Jesus, he also did as Christ, such that for you to say, okay, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and a little later on it goes on to explain, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, right? Well, the idea that the Word becomes flesh and dwells among us is, in a sense, telling us that, um, that among us there is a sort of fleshly meaning and a sort of fleshly understanding that um, that we see when we look at him in the scriptures, that the heavenly is in a sense couched in the fleshly, such that if you were to say, for example, that Jesus came down as a man and taught and healed and prophesied as a man, having first been in the presence of God, um, then... Um, then you would say correspondingly that on the level of the parable, since he was the Word, and the Word became flesh, right, then one could also say that the Word healed men, right, that the Word uh, cured blindnesses and, and opened people's ears and 
um, opened people's mouths and gave them hands to work with and feet to walk with and cleaned, cleaned them of their, you know, leprosy, their skin disease, um, and so on. Um, that it works on, as a metaphor as well. And so when, when Peter says, Thou art Christ, the Son of the living God, um, Jesus says to Simon, Barjona, he says, Blessed art thou, Simon, Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed this to you, but my Father which is in heaven. So we see Christ as a singular answer given by Simon, Simon Barjona, uh, as being different from and distinct from what men say about him, because the question was, what do men say, and then what do you say? Right, and what men say is various um, various things. You're this, you're that, you're one of the prophets come back to life. You're uh, Elijah, you're Jeremiah, whatever. Um, it's just it's it's different things, and it corresponds to Christianity as a whole. The Christian churches, for example, which are run by men by mankind, um, they each say different things about Jesus, and so th therein lies the contrast. Therein lies the revelation. So when you see the name Jesus you understand that it corresponds to men's teaching and who do men say that Jesus is. And when you see the word Christ, right, you understand it as this is what the Father in heaven reveals. Okay, so that was the paradigm. And when Paul uses this particular paradigm in his letters, he will either say Jesus Christ or he will say Christ Jesus. And sometimes he will say the Lord Jesus. Sometimes he will say the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, but what it basically means is when he says Jesus first and then Christ, he's speaking of having gone from understanding him on the level of the flesh, in other words, who men say that he is, to understanding him on the level of the spirit. That is to say what God reveals to him directly and not flesh and blood, right? So you have these two aspects, him going from understanding him on a lower level to understanding him on a higher level. But then he also speaks of Christ Jesus. This is the falling away. This, is the, this represents, in a sense, the interim period, the fall from grace into the long 2,000-year um, church age where men are in the ascendant and men are defining the word of God according to their own definitions, their own preferences, um, their own interpretations, basically sub subverting the higher level of meaning to the lower. And so we are not in Jesus Christ. We're not in Christ in other words. We're not like a we're not in the um in the state where the Father in heaven is defining this for us. But men are defining this for us. And so we, in a sense, have fallen from grace. But as I spoke of before in Philippians, which is why I did that book first, um, there, there, um, there's a um, there's a resignation um, to um, the churches that are in Christ Jesus that um, that it's okay that um, that the spiritual gets um, gets in a sense subverted by the um, fleshly because it is a means of preservation of the mystery and so since there is inevitably going to be a falling away it is important to understand that since the letters are written on two different levels as long as the fleshly meaning is preserved it carries with it the heavenly, such that the, the, the mystery can get lost. But at some point when the Father decides to reveal himself to us, then we can go from that fleshly level again to that spiritual level because, again, the spiritual is always couched in the flesh. So when he says to the Ephesians, and he calls them the faithful in Christ Jesus, what he means is, that they are um, entrusted with the twofold message, and that um, that regardless of whether um, people teach it rightly or wrongly, for um, true motivation, 
um, or for, you know, or that they're motivated by falsehood or by greed or by fleshly concerns or whatever, that it doesn't matter because the message itself is retained in the fleshly level to be revealed. So it's sealed and it's delivered unto us at the end of time. So that's kind of the context of it in a nutshell. So let me start out. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. Again, he went from understanding Jesus to understanding Christ. Was he was as he was on the road to Damascus, um, he encountered Christ, and um, he went from understanding him as man to understanding him as the Lord. And he says to the saints which are at Ephesus and to the faithful in Christ Jesus. Why? Well, when he says the faithful in Christ Jesus, what he means is these are the people who understand that, um, that there are two levels of these scriptures. And if they're faithful, then they're resigned to the fact that these scriptures have these two meanings. They understand that they're going, that the church as a whole is going to go from Christ to Jesus, that the higher level is going to be um, replaced in a sense by the lower level, but they're okay with it because in their mind they know that somewhere down the line, that they're making a sacrifice in a sense, that somewhere down the line because that message is inherent in the flesh and can be revealed essentially at any time, but it will be revealed at the time of the Lord's choosing, at the time of the Father's choosing. Um, so, but he's telling, he's calling them the faithful in this because they understand that. It says, grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, so early on in the Christian age, right, the immediate proximate sense of this is that early on in the Christian age, um, they had this revelation from the Father uh, about these two meanings. And uh, again, in the ultimate sense, he's talking about those of us who are waking up to this reality and going from Christ to Jesus, in other words, the church age, the age in which the Christ is hidden by the flesh, um, to Jesus Christ, which is the other way around, going from the flesh to the Christ, going from what men say to what God says. And so he's speaking, in a sense, to two audiences. And then there's this intermediate period of Christ Jesus where people don't get it, but they define Jesus in their own way. It says, Blessed be God, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, again, in the proximate, immediate sense, um, he's talking about those who, in his day, went from understanding Jesus as a man to having the same revelation that Simon or Jonah had. And in the ultimate sense, he's talking about those of us in the church, the spiritual Ephesians, if you will, uh, who are in, now in Christ Jesus, waking up from that and getting out from underneath that and um, going from Jesus to Christ. Okay, so it says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. In other words, in the higher level, uh, the heavenly places, if you will. Um, and he's blessed us with that. So again, it's corresponding to the beginning and the end, those who understand that and know that and experience that. Um, it says, according as he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. It says, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. So again, in his day, they went from understanding him as a man to understanding him on the level of the Christ, flesh and blood, to the Father in heaven. And just as we will, we shall transition from this age of Christ Jesus, um, the spiritual revelation from the Father being um, um, overtaken by men and their fleshly understanding in the blindness of their minds and their hearts, Right to having our spiritual eyes and ears and mouths opened um, and going from the age of Jesus to the age of Christ where we ourselves had to receive direct revelation from God. 
and this is according to the good pleasure of his will. He wills it. Okay. It says, to the praise and glory of his grace. Why? Because it's his gift. Right? It's not something that we've done. It's something that he's done for us on our behalf by um, preserving us through this age. So Christ Jesus has value. It's, it's a means of sealing the mystery and preserving it until such time as God wills to pour his grace out on us and reveal himself to us directly in our hearts and minds. Um, to the praise and glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. Again, we are, we are to be accepted into the beloved, but this is his plan, and it's going to happen in his own time. In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. Um, when he speaks of blood, see, the, the, the blood refers to the sacrifice, refers to his giving of his life, his sacrificing his life. Well, the sacrifice of his life is, in a sense, the sacrifice of that ex direct experience of God and the reduction of us, in a sense, and himself, and Paul also, to that level of the flesh. He's resigned himself to the level of flesh and blood, if you will. So the blood of the cross, the blood of all this, essentially refers to the death of the mystery, the shedding of the blood, the life is in the blood, as it says in Leviticus, um, the shedding of that life, the sacrifice of that Christ level to the level of Jesus, to the level of the flesh. Okay. Um, through the redemption of his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. Why? Well, because there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between what happens in the flesh and what is heavenly, what, what the flesh is, in a sense, um, representing the heavenly couched in the flesh. So it's all there. It's just the life has gone out of it. Um, um, but it will be restored, of course, just as Jesus, or Christ, actually, is resurrected. So shall we be resurrected. Um, but this is a process, and we are basically the harbingers of that, that we are there to bring this about. Um, according to the riches of his grace, again, it's his, him doing it. I mean, it's done. It's already done. There's no adding to it or subtracting from it. We're just reading it right out of Paul, the same thing that people have been reading for almost 2,000 years. It's just inherently there. It says, wherein he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence. Um, so there's wisdom and prudence involved in this plan of his, having made known to us the mystery of his will. So what is his will? Well, his will would be to preserve us through the age and then to enlighten us and bring us to the level of Christ, according to his good pleasure, which he hath purposed in himself. Well, again, Jesus is in a sense a metaphor. He is the word, the word made flesh. Right? He comes down and he speaks and teaches and heals and so on. And then he dies or is killed. And, uh, you know, in a sense, for three days and three nights, as he speaks of it, you know, he is buried in the earth or subsumed under an earthly understanding, just as, just as Paul is trying to express through his usage of the term Christ Jesus. Well, in a sense, being, being in the flesh or being, you know, um, being in the earth and under the earth is symbolically speaking um, him being covered up by you know an earthly sort of surface level meaning um, and he's purposed this in himself why because he also arose out of that Christ arose out of death right which is this realm which is this age the whole age of flesh and blood is speaking of death is speaking of Hades um, it says that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ. So again, the logic is still pointing to that as the meaning, that it's only in the fullness of the age that we are gathered together in Christ. So where are we before that happens? We are in confusion. We are in the level of the flesh. We are still bound, as Paul puts it, by the by theologies and you know the churches and the various teachings it's who men say that jesus is rather than what the father in heaven says which is the christ level so it says that 
in the disposition, dispensation of the fullness of time. He might gather together in one all things in Christ. Why? Because if we are all on the Christ level, for example, if we only understand his letter as being just that, uh, an encoded message, a two-edged sword, as it says in Revelation, that once we come to the unity of the understanding of this message, then we're all on the same page, so to speak, and we're not arguing and fighting and defining, and we're, you know, it's none of that. It's all just there inherently, and it's just a, it's just a, a, a different language that we learn to speak. It's a spiritual, symbolic language, but that gives us certainty, where if you follow this code, you're like, oh, well, that's what he means, and you're clear with it. You're clear on it, and it makes sense to you. It says that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, not Jesus, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. Well, what is heavenly in a sense and what is earthly? Our heavenly nature and our earthly nature. The, 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 the two become one in him. Why? Because he, the word, embodies both aspects. And so there is no more uh, difference. There is no more dichotomy. You understand one as, in a sense, um, a reflection, if you will, the other one. A lower reflection, but in a sense, still a reflection. So he has a twofold aspect again. Um, it says, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him, who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. So he's got a plan, and he's, um, he's doing this according to his own will, um, but they haven't obtained an inheritance. And what is that? That inheritance is, in a sense, well, in the immediate proximate sense, he's saying, look, I've got this on two different levels, you know, and I'm giving you this as an inheritance and also as a trust, but also to uh, those of us at the end times, the Ephesian church at the end of time, uh, we are also to receive this inheritance, this insight, this knowledge. Um, that we should be to the praise of his glory, who first trusted in Christ. Right? So, in other words, um, there's going to be, well, what does he say first? Right? Because he's speaking of them at the beginning of that age and Christ as being that spirit. So they, they first understood it on that level. They were the first, right? It implies a falling away, and it implies that there will be a second, right? It's all sort of implied in that statement. In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, all right? Having gone from Jesus to Christ, they understood the word of truth, just as we can now through the understanding of this almost simple uh, uh, it's almost too simple actually it's, it's hard to believe that nobody um, seems to understand this and for the 2,000 years no one's been able to figure this out but again God is doing this according to his will and his own dispensation and his own time and it's a show of the power of God um, because he can harden people's hearts and he can open them up at his will and this is proof of that um, after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. So there is a promise there. In other words, he's saying, look, in these two meanings, there is a promise because we're going to go from the level of Christ down to the level of Jesus, God in the flesh. Right, um, defined by men, etc. But it's just a promise. He's promising them that this will pay off at the end, and hopefully it will pay off. Well, I'm sure it will. But uh, you know, I, it's just a matter of time. It's just a matter of when. It's just a matter of how long it takes. But it's there. And anyway, it says, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. So again, it's a trust. Having this message on two levels and telling them to be faithful in Christ Jesus means basically that since it's going to work on both levels, it doesn't matter which one wins out. 
we know that the fleshly level is going to win out for a while. Just resign yourself to that reality and be cool with it because we know this is going to pay off because it is earnest. All right. It is a, um, it is a trust. Um, it is sealed. Right. So it's just, a, it's an investment. It's a seed that is sown. Right. But it will play out, will grow, will happen. It says, Unto the praise of his glory, which again, this will bring glory to God. Wherefore, I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and love unto all the saints. Okay, again, it says, cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. Okay, so it says, Wherefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus. Okay, so he's speaking again across time. Um, in the immediate sense, he may be talking about those who were faithful in the word and eventually caught on and understood the Christ level after that. But it was through the Lord Jesus. It was through the scriptures. It was through reading the scriptures, even on the fleshly level, on the level of the Lord Jesus, um, that because of their faith, they were able to receive Jesus Christ it says um, that the Lord, the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. Wherefore, I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and love unto all the saints. OK, faith in the Lord Jesus in this in this case would basically mean in the immediate proximate sense when speaking to the Ephesians in his own day. Um, because of their faith in the Lord Jesus, because faith on this level, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God and through their love uh, of all the saints. In other words, they didn't have bitterness in their hearts. They didn't want to go out there and kill everybody that didn't agree with them or whatever, but because they believed in the word or whatever, um, it says, cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, uh, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. Okay, so in other words, these people, symbolically speaking, are still in the Lord Jesus because he speaks of this in the future tense. That the Lord, the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom. So that explains why they're in the Lord Jesus, because they're going through this transition. In the early church, um, this would have meant that they understood Jesus on the level of the flesh, but in through Paul's prayers um, for them on their behalf in his day, that they might... Um, Give, they, they might receive the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him whom the Lord Jesus Christ. So this is a transition from the Lord Jesus to the Lord Jesus Christ. And also to those of us at the end of the age, because again, there's an immediate proximate and there's an ultimate meaning. Here in the ultimate level, those of us who are now in the Lord Jesus, because Paul is making prayers for us that we may receive the spirit of of wisdom and revelation, again, uh, to understand things fully in the knowledge of him who, the Lord Jesus Christ, in other words, that we may receive the Christ, that we may go from Jesus to Christ. Um, and he elaborates, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that ye may know what is the hope of his calling. Well, what is the hope of his calling? In this context, the hope of his calling is the, is the recognizing the fact that these things are written on these two levels. And you see the fulfillment thereof. You understand the meaning of it you, through the syntax of Paul and his writing in such a particular way so as to have encoded this message that, you, that the eyes of your understanding being enlightened actually see this, that you may know what is the hope of his calling. And so once you see it, you do know what the hope of his calling is and correspondingly what the riches of the glory of his inheritance is in the saints. In other words, 
it gives us power and it gives us authority and it gives us certainty and it gives us unity. And in a sense, it gives God glory. And it gives us the power to transition from Jesus to Christ. And it goes on. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us who believe? And you think about what kind of power it is that you receive through this knowledge. The power, in a sense, to overthrow all of the institutions, all of the governments, all of everything in the world. Because we see that power has been given to us. So this is big. Uh, according to the working of his mighty power which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places. Why? Well, Jesus, according to Paul's analogy here, um, is not what is risen. It is Christ that is risen, the spirit that is risen, the wisdom that has, has risen, the revelation that has risen. It is that meaning which has risen from the flesh, in a sense, to the heavenly, and gone from earthly to the heavenly. Um, so he wrought that in Christ, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. Um, so um, he's, again, he's raised up that name of Christ, which we now are privy to. And uh, this has an eternal aspect to it and hath put all things under his feet, and gave him to be head over all things to the church. Okay, so in the ultimate sense, right, he then uh, will reign over the church. Um, it says, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. So he's going to, um, he's going to raise up, in a sense, the church because... He raised up his body on the third day. So on the third spiritual day, his body, which is the church, right, um, is going to be raised also. So again, it works on the spiritual. Um, and you he hath quickened, who were dead in trespasses and sins. Well, in the immediate proximate sense, right, they had gone from, you know, the same kind of darkness we were walking in, and they were enlightened by Christ. And um, they are faithful in Christ Jesus, basically meaning that they understand the two levels and they're okay with it because they're just there to transmit it and to be faithful to that message and to that teaching as far as possible until, you know, it's finally subverted, which it will be, of course, for a time. But then it will be raised up again, just as Christ was raised on the third day. So also his body, which is the church, will be raised up also on the third day. It says, Wherein, in time past, you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience in his day as in ours. We now uh, walk according to the course of this world. I mean, I mean, let's face it, the churches, they got to have money, they got to pay utilities, right? They got to pay salaries. They got to do all of the things that, you know, the world does. They're, in a sense, um, in the image of the world. Um, you know, not to say that they're as bad or whatever, but I'm just saying that they're still part of this world. And, and he's trying to take us from this world unto the world to come. Um, and he does so by encoding this in his message. It says, among whom... Um, also, we all had our conversation in times past in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But God, who is rich in his mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace ye are saved, and hath raised us up together, and made us to sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Well, because the message is subverted, and um, 
It says, and has raised us up together and made us to sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Well, while the church is down here on the lower level for the church age or whatever, they and their message and their understanding are on the heavenly level. So that in the age of Christ Jesus, they are still there on the heavenly level. The message is still there on those two levels, right? Even during the age of Christ Jesus. In fact, Christ Jesus is the mechanism for the transference of this message from his age to ours. So it's a surety. It's, a, it's, a, it's an earnest, if you will, as he puts it. Um, that in the ages to come, right? So again, he's speaking past the age of Christ Jesus, right? Um, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus, right? Why? Because, because if he's going to show us grace, even after we were dead in our trespasses, even if, after we were in Christ Jesus all of these years, right? Then that is exceedingly rich in his grace. Then he is exceedingly rich in his grace because... Um, it is by grace that we are saved. It says, For by grace that ye are saved through faith, and that not of yourselves it is the gift of God. Well, why? Because in the age of Christ Jesus, we're out there trying to earn it. We're out there trying to make it happen. And Paul's saying it's not like that. All right? It's, it is a gift from God. All right? And that's how God wants it. But it also means that we are all, in a sense, forgiven. Because nobody could get it right. Nobody understood it and because of that um it is a gift from god or rather because it is a gift of god nobody understood it um does not of works lest any man should boast why well why should any denomination why should any church get out there and say oh we were right you know well then god doesn't want it that way he wants everybody to just say i'm sorry i was wrong i didn't get it god will be just you know that's fine i made provision for you in christ jesus through Christ Jesus, by Christ Jesus. I knew that you were going to get it wrong. I made provision for that. I gave you grace. You understood it on a very low level, right? But I'm going to raise you up so that you can sit with the apostles, that you can sit with Jesus then in heavenly places because of the grace that I'm imparting unto you. That's essentially the subtext here. For we are his workmanship. Created in Christ Jesus unto good works, right? So, again, he's still talking about the interim period because he uses the word unto. In other words, this will bear fruit eventually, but until then, we are what? In Christ Jesus. So, again, he's telling the Ephesians to resign themselves, essentially, to their faith. That, that the church is going to be in Christ Jesus until we are quickened together with Christ, as he says. It says, For we as workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Wherefore, again, future tense, wherefore remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, who were called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands. Right. Well, circumcision is not really of the flesh. Circumcision is of the heart. All right. So um, um, we were, in a sense, all these years, the time that we were in Christ Jesus. In other words, we were in the flesh and we were, in a sense, uncircumcised. Right. Our hearts were not removed or, say, circumcised or separated from the flesh, um, symbolically speaking. It says um, that at that, that at that time ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. Okay, so in the age of Christ, Jesus, we were without Christ. Again, because we went from Christ to Jesus. We went from the level where the Father is revealing this to us to the level where flesh and blood is revealing this to us. So we are, in effect, without Christ. And being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, well, this is spiritual Israel. You know, on the level of the flesh, in the immediate proximate terms, yeah, he's talking about Gentiles, as we understand Gentiles, uh, as not being Jews, not being physical descendants from Abraham or whatever. Um, but 
in the spiritual sense, in the spiritual Israel, we, um, without Christ, are Gentiles and strangers, as he puts it, from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Okay, so in in Christ Jesus, we are strangers from the covenants of the promise. Again, what does he call this? He calls this an earnest, right? A down payment, if you will, right? To what is going to be promised. So he's still speaking of this in the future. So as a future event, we are, in a sense, in Christ Jesus until the dispensation of time. Um, having no hope and without God in the world. Again, in Christ Jesus, we are basically in being subjected to the teachings of men. But now, in Christ Jesus, ye who were sometimes far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. Well, there is always this Christ level because it's working on two levels, and there's always this fleshly level. The fleshly level is, in a sense, the blood of Christ, as I mentioned briefly before which is in Christ Jesus. It says, For he is our peace, who hath made both one, the upper and the lower, and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us. Well, in a sense, he's talking about between him and his age and us and our age. He's broken down that middle wall, that, that Christ Jesus level has been removed, in a sense, and we have become one in our understanding. Having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace. Why? Well, because since we only understood it on the level of the flesh, right? Um, and that, in a sense, being commandments, being ordinances, um, the flesh of his enmity, but because the flesh carries with it the spiritual, they are one thing. Um, but by seeing the spiritual, you put the fleshly into its proper and true context. Then that flesh, at that point, once you gain the insight, becomes profitable. Because you then understand through the flesh, through the law, the, the, the heavenly, the Christ level. It says, For he is our peace who hath made both one, and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh, in the word, the word became flesh, the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make himself of twain one new man, so making peace. And that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. Because why? Because everything is parabolic. And so when you go from understanding just on the fleshly level to understanding on the parabolic level, you understand that the two become one. And that the body, you know, the God-made flesh, right, um, in a sense, um, creates an enmity, right? Because it disguises, by conveying in a sense, it also disguises Right. But once you come to understand the lower and the upper as being one thing, right, then there is no longer any enmity there, that the two are one. And it says that he might reconcile both unto God by one body, in one body by the Christ, having slain the enmity thereby, and came and preached peace to you who were afar off and to them that were nigh. Right. So, again, you have the proximate and you have the ultimate. Those who were nigh were those who knew Jesus, who were there back in his day. And those who were afar off would be those of us who never got to see him, those of us who never witnessed him or whatever. But he's brought peace between us because we understand as they did. It says, For through him we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. In other words, they understood by the scriptures having twofold nature, but that they were both one thing that one was a conveyor of the truth and, and that the truth is contained in it and therefore can be revealed from it. And um, so that we can both, them and us, have access by one spirit, that is to say Christ, unto the Father. Flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father which is in heaven. Now therefore, you are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. 
So through this revelation, through this mystery, we therefore become one with them. We become one with the saints. All right. And in a sense, we bring their work to its conclusion. We, we are the ones who finish the job, in other words. Um, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. The going from what men say to what God says. Going from Jesus to Christ. And thus being built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. So Paul is saying, look, what I'm saying, same thing all the other apostles. And all the other prophets are saying. All of them speak on these two levels. Um, Jesus Christ, of course, himself being the chief cornerstone. In his age going from Jesus to Christ. In our age going from Jesus to Christ. Um, in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also being builded together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. So once we gain this spiritual understanding, we then become the holy temple. We then become um, the habitation of God, as he puts it. For this cause, I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles, right? Gentiles being those of us in Christ Jesus, those of us who have had our, our, um, you know, our place in this world. Um, the prisoner of Jesus Christ. Why? Well, because his message. He is himself the message. In other words, and he is his message is in uh, a sense uh, imprisoned, right? Um, but it's for us, right? Through Christ Jesus, right? But being that uh, on the road to Damascus, he went from Jesus to Christ, and um, he understood at that point um, the mission that was given to him, what was revealed to him, things that he couldn't speak, which were unlawful to speak, um, but that, you know, were inherently there. Um, anyway, this is how... Um, if ye have heard of the dispensation of the grace which is given me to you word, in other words, if you've heard of this dis dispensation, which it is a dispensation, it's a, it's a revelation, it's a gift, it's the gift of God, uh, as Paul puts it. How that by revelation um, he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote before in few words. Again, there is a mystery that was made known unto God. And if you have heard of it, have you heard of this dispensation of the grace of God? He's asking, right? How that by revelation I have made known unto you the mystery. Well, there is a revelation. There is a mystery here. As I wrote a four and few words, whereby when you read, ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of what? In the mystery of Christ. All right? So in other words, you guys are down here, but I'm up here. All right? And if you really want to understand what I'm saying, you go read this stuff, right? And through Christ Jesus, you can attain to Jesus Christ. Which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit, in other words, Christ, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the Gospels. By the Gospels, sorry. Um, so those of us who do not know this mystery could be fellow heirs. It's a gift, again, the gift of God, and of the same body, and the partakers of his promise in Christ by the Gospel, the Gospel being this good news, which we are to spread throughout the world. Whereof, whereof I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of his power. In other words, his power actually has its effect. And the power that was given unto him by the grace of God, according to the gift of the grace of God, given unto Paul. So you didn't figure this out. It was given to him by the effectual working of his power. Well, it is through God's power that this message is revealed to those of us at the end of time, and it will have its effect. It will be effectual, because Paul states that it will be. So we have that confidence here at the end of time, because we have heard, and we have been made to know the mystery that he is writing about. And it says, Unto me, who am less than the least of all saints, is this grace given, 
that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. Okay, so that's his mission, to impart this um, unser the unsearchable riches of Christ unto us via his message, via his word. And to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery. So again, all men. Who is this for? Did Jesus Christ come just to save the church? No, he came to save the whole world. So this is a message for everyone in the whole world at the end of time. To make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery. Again, the fellowship of the mystery would be those of them at the end of the age, or at the beginning of the age, who understood the, the, the two levels of meaning that Paul was giving them. And um, to make all men see um, in the future sense means that they won't see for a while, but then they will see, which from the beginning of the world have been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ. Again, going from the fleshly to the spiritual. To the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. So this is the message to the church. And so we take this message to the church. You're supposed to take this message to the church. And presumably they are supposed to accept it. According to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. Again, his purpose was in Christ Jesus our Lord. Why? Because he conveyed it on the level of the flesh from Christ to Jesus. And then our Lord. Why? Because the reign of God um, is still over this age. Behold, I am with thee until the end of the age, Jesus says to his disciples. Um, so, falling from grace, he is still our Lord. Christ Jesus, our Lord. All right, so he's still with us. In whom we have boldness and access with confidence by the faith of him. Wherefore I desire that ye faint not at my tribulations for you, which is your glory. Now his tribulation would be our misunderstanding of him, as it says in Second Peter that people are going to twist his words because they contain some things which are hard to understand, and they are a little hard to understand and a little hard to explain, but they're basically there and they're basically clear. Um, anyway, but his tribulation, symbolically speaking, uh, in the ultimate sense, will refer to the 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 difficulties that lie in store for him across the age, uh, as well as his immediate difficulties which he has in his own time. It says, For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Right? Why? Because if he's bowing his knees to the Father of the Lord Jesus Christ, he's saying, look, I'm making myself a slave. I'm making myself a servant. I will bow my knee. I will do his will. I will, I will endure these many tribulations that I am going to undergo because I bow my knee to the Father. So I'm not afraid to make myself a servant or whatever. I have faith, I believe. It says, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might, by his spirit in the inner man. That again is going from Jesus to Christ. That we might be strengthened in our spirits. Um, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. Faith in what? Well, faith in the scriptures, right? That believing what the scriptures say and having this insight, having this revelation, right? We go from the level of the flesh to the level of the spirit. Um, so that Christ may dwell in our hearts through that faith, that ye, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height, and to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge, that ye may might be filled with all the fullness of God. Well, this is, again, this is direct experience of the Father, um, and it passes all knowledge. I mean, what, what has all this knowledge gotten us? You know, we've defined when a book was written. We define, you know, whether we thought it was real or fake. We define, you know, 
things in their historical context or whatever. But what has all that gotten us? It hasn't gotten us to direct revelation of God yet, um, which passeth knowledge. Okay, and it hasn't filled us with all the fullness of God, and it certainly hasn't revealed to us the mystery that Paul is conveying to us, which is the earnest of the Spirit. Now unto him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us. Right? Well, if he's able to pull this off, if he's able to take us from Jesus to Christ, if he's able to uh, reprove the entire world, and the church of God, in a sense, um, then um, that is exceedingly abundantly above all that we have asked for or thought. And it is according to the power that worketh in them, right? So there is a power that is in them, and that's what this revelation imparts. It says, Unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages. Well, again, it's Christ Jesus because it involves all ages. And it's by Christ Jesus because to say that something is by this or through this means that that is the vehicle, right, or the mechanism that um, that is by Christ Jesus means that by going from the higher level to the lower level throughout the ages, world without end, then because of that, God is able to do exceedingly abundantly all that we ask or think because we're thinking way down here. All right. And he's saying, no, it's up here. Right. So that is exceedingly abundantly what we down here were thinking. All right. It says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called. He's telling the Ephesians who he states in the first verse are in Christ Jesus. Right that he is a prisoner of the Lord, and he's beseeching them, and across time, of course, us, that we walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you're called. In other words, just keep this message, keep this truth in trust. It says, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Well, what is the bond? Well, the bond is just the resignation uh, that you are going to um, be preserving a mystery which has two levels. And because you know that there are two levels, you have this unity of understanding. So he's saying, look, keep this teaching, keep this understanding. Um, but it is a bond. You are bound to it. It says, there is one body and one spirit, even as ye are called in one hope of your calling, again, the fulfillment of this mystery at the end of time. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. Again, those of us who are baptized are baptized into his death, which is Christ Jesus. One God and Father of all, who is above all, and through all, and in you all. Again, he's with us from beginning to end, whatever. But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of of Christ. So even though it may not look like um, everything is a gift, it still is. Like even the curse, even us going down to the fleshly level, it's still a gift because it pays off in the end and it covers our sins because nobody could have known this. It was withheld from us. Just like the eyes of the men on the way to Emmaus could not see Jesus or the Word of God because their eyes were being held. Well, it's the same analogy, it's the same parable in a sense. Um, it says, Wherefore he said, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. Why? Well, when he ascended up on high, it was Christ that rose. So, in other words, you have this fleshly level, right? And when he rose above that or whatever, he led captivity, which is what men say that he is, the deception, in other words. He led captivity captive. And then it says, and gave gifts unto men, right? So that's the payoff. That's where he reveals himself to man. 